capturing the changing nature of light was the lifelong obsession of Claude Monet, the father of Impressionism. He was looking at different light on the same subject matter. A fleeting art was meant to capture fleeting moments. We see Monet trying to use art as a kind of survey of his environment. The movement would have its roots in Paris, but would draw on diverse inspiration to achieve its artistic vision. There was already this bubbling faction that wanted to show something different, do something different. As Turner had actually been to France to look at French work, so Monet comes to London and sees Turner's work. In London, they saw different conditions of light and atmosphere uh, than they had seen in Paris. It would be a single painting, however, that would lend its name to this new movement, which would be pivotal in the story of modern art. It does look exactly like an impression. It's like he's gone out there, he's rendered exactly what it feels like to be in that space and what's before him. is only an impression, instantaneous. Hence the label they've given us. All because of me, for that matter. Monet was born in the 9th arrondissement of Paris in 1840. At the age of five, Monet with his family moved to the coastal town of La Havre in Normandy. His father had aspirations for him to go into the family grocery business. But from a young age, Monet knew his future would be in art. We know from early on that he was drawing caricatures at school, he was doing little charcoal drawings, so he always had this kind of budding interest in art. As a young person, he was showing and selling work, which sort of means two things. It means that, you know, he's rather good at art, but also with a keen eye for making a bit of money. In love, he trained with somebody called Orchard, who I think I'd never heard of particularly, but um, turns out to have been a pupil of David. Jacques-Louis David was a neoclassical French painter who was known for his austere and moral history paintings. One of his students, Jacques-Francois Orchard, was in turn the teacher of Monet. However, it would be an encounter with the landscape artist Eugène Boudin in Honfleur that would set Monet on the course, which would determine the rest of his artistic output. I love that in art history where you get somebody who painted these really static sort of Pompier paintings being the kind of grandfather of a man who paints blurry water lilies. He was very much influenced by a chap called Boudin, who was actually a brilliant seaside artist. He really got money into en plein air painting, you know, painting out of doors instead of in a studio. And that's one of the big sort of dividing moments in, in French art history, I suppose, really. Boudin was one of the first people in French painting to be very interested in capturing weather conditions. And this is what he first began to teach Monet to do himself. It was a move by Monet to the Parisian suburb of Argenteuil, an area popular at the time with artists, which would see him take the idea of en plein air painting and elevate it to another level. He would also hone his style and develop his lifelong obsession of capturing the changes of light and color. It was there that he really began to develop his art. Painting outdoors from life, being in nature and really representing the changing seasons, the changing atmosphere, uh, really reflecting what it felt like to be in that landscape. They kind of coalesced as a gang, really, the Impressionists. So he's there with, with Manet and Renoir, and they're all, you know, painting each other wildly. And also he, he buys a little flat bottom boat, which I think is so sweet, and starts painting. He had Renoir out there, Manet, and Manet actually painted a couple of pictures of Monet at work. So we see him working in his boat, which was his sort of studio boat, specially crafted so that he could cruise around on the water, capturing the effects of light on water, the changing ripples, the reflections. That was something that he was continually fascinated with. 
Impressionism is only direct sensation. All great painters were less or more Impressionists. Before moving to Argenteuil, however, Monet would find himself in London. The Franco-Prussian War had started, and in order to avoid conscription, Monet, along with fellow artist Pizarro, fled to England, where they would find inspiration from an older generation of British artists. We don't think of London as a, as a hotbed of avant-garde painting, but um, he and Pizarro came here and they saw Constable, and then of course he saw Turner. We know that Monet and Pizarro came to the National Gallery uh, to see the paintings, but in particular to see uh, the paintings of Turner. So he was looking at those amazing seascapes, landscapes, changing weather, quite dramatic, very free. He's almost the Impressionist before Impressionism. As a city, London would also leave a lasting impression on Monet and his developing technique. Monet had already begun to paint in a very experimental, brightly colored manner in the very late 1860s, 1869 in London. They saw different conditions of light and atmosphere uh, than they had seen in, in Paris. Of course, we're familiar with uh, illustrations of Dickens London, which is pretty dire. All the business of, of coal going into the atmosphere that type of fog was actually filtering the colors and the sort of thing that he was seeing so that he could actually see or not see certain things and could actually record the impression of these tenuous forms. In 1871, Monet left London after being refused inclusion in the Royal Academy exhibition. He moved to Zandam in the Netherlands, where he lived until the autumn of that year, when he moved to Argenteuil. In 1876, Monet, along with his two children and his wife Camille, moved to Veteuil, a small village to the northwest of Paris. They shared a house with Ernest Oshte, a patron and collector of the Impressionist movement, alongside his wife Alice and their six children. In 1878, however, Oshte filed for bankruptcy and fled to Belgium. And later that year, Monet's wife Camille was diagnosed with cancer. The following year, on the 5th of September, Camille passed away, which would prompt Monet to create one of his most haunting paintings. Camille, or Camille as she's known in French, is featured quite a lot in his paintings from Women in the Garden quite early on. She was sort of this figure that embraced a lot of the modern fashions and she was a modern woman as conceived by Monet. He does this rather wonderful painting of her on her deathbed, which is a, it's a sort of flurry of whiteness. It's a very strange and touching image. He watched her die and then painted and he wrote about the process of death and he was fascinated by it actually, the, the transmutation of her face from, from presumably pink to to white, to grey, to blue, to green, he said. But it seemed to prove something that he was getting at in, in Impression Sunrise, which was that idea of life as evanescent and, and its evanescence expressed by changes in colour. He said of that that he was quite shocked because he found that he was actually just doing the painting and not really concentrating on his grief. And I think he was a bit surprised at himself. I mean, so surprised that actually he recorded that emotion. I am good at only two things, and those are gardening and painting. After the death of Camille, Monet would continue to live in Veteuil with Alice Oshte. The death of Ernest in 1891 would give Monet and Alice the opportunity to marry. By this time, the two of them and their sizable families had moved to Giverny, a small village in Normandy. It would be here that Monet would create the perfect habitat to continue his life work of painting and documenting the changing nature of light. Right from the time he moved to Argentoy, when he began to paint the whole uh, area uh, in canvas after canvas, we see Monet trying to use art as a kind of survey of his uh, environment. But when he decided to build his own garden at Giverny, 
it was here he was creating his own world that he could go back to over and over and over again. There'd be all the plants that he wanted to paint. You know, there were nasturtiums where he wanted them tumbling across the path, so it was quite heavily curated. He extended it and changed it. He added a water garden, which, you know, the nymphia and the water lilies came from. He really invested in it. He put in his Japanese bridge. He did a lot of planting of, of willows and lilies. His garden is an artwork. I can't think of anybody who, who did that. I mean, Dali obviously sculpted his garden, but that was as a, a work all of its own. It wasn't so that he could then reproduce it in endless paintings. Monet would spend the remaining 40 years of his life in Giverny, studying the same things in ever-changing conditions. On December the 5th, 1926, Monet passed away, leaving behind some of the most famous and arresting images in art history. But how did Monet first establish such a reputation? We can trace the origins of his fame back to a single painting, a painting which would unintentionally lend its name to an entire movement. For me, a landscape does not exist in its own right, since its appearance changes at any moment. Claude Monet is considered a master of his time, and his work is revered throughout the world. In 1874, however, Monet and his contemporaries were considered outsiders to the staid Parisian salon. Working under the name of the Anonymous Society, this group of young artists decided to take action and exhibit their work themselves. I think it's important to understand the time the system was the salon. These huge salons, multiple works stacked, hung one upon another, and they would be judged by the Académie de Beaux-Arts. And it was a pretty rigid system, which didn't have a lot of room for anything avant-garde change. The art establishment was still very much committed to a kind of academic painting. And here were young painters carrying out their works in an entirely new and what many thought slapdash way. So there was already this bubbling faction that wanted to show something different, do something different, and there was no place to do it. So I think that's essentially what brought them together. They were constantly turned down by the salon, so they had to, you know, it was a sort of salon des refusés, as they say, a salon of the refused. They put on a, a show of their own. They found a space in the studio of a quite famous photographer, Nadar, on the Boulevard de Capucine. And at the beginning, it was 30 artists, not necessarily all working in the same way, just all wanting to do something a little bit different and maybe challenge the status quo. One of the paintings Monet submitted to the exhibition was Impression Sunrise, a landscape depicting the port of La Havre. It was part of a series of paintings Monet made of his hometown, one of which, the museum at Le Havre, hangs in the National Gallery in London. Impression Sunrise, however, would be the most experimental. Impression Sunrise was probably painted in 1873, and our painting of the museum at Le Havre was probably painted at more or less the same time. In fact, if you look out to see, what you see is Impression Sunrise. If you turn around and look into the city, what you see is our view of the museum at Le Havre. If you were to compare it to the kind of works that were winning awards and being given accolades in the salon, I mean, it's very instantly clear quite how different this was. I mean, it looks like a sketch. It's got quite an interesting range of color. It's just very free. You have a sense that it was painted at white heat very, very quickly to capture a very transient change of atmosphere uh, right at the beginning of the day. What we can see in that painting, we see the beginnings of what would be called now his practice. Our picture of the museum is much calmer, is much more structured. Perhaps one of the reasons it's much more structured is that it centers on a big piece of architecture. But if you look at the water in particular, uh, the minute touches of flickering paint that depict it, you see that it is the same imagination at work. The efforts of Monet and the young group of artists, like many artists of avant-garde movements, were not met with critical praise. 
the Parisian artistic establishment could not seem to comprehend the exhibition's artistic merit. Some critics were excited by it, saw it as a sort of a sea change and new ideas filtering in and the excitement of that. There was also a lot of backlash, people finding it ridiculous, looking at the works and thinking, what is this? I've never seen anything like it, it's so unpolished. It was pretty badly um, reviewed and, of course, famously, Impression Sunrise was, you know, roundly derided. It would be a review by the critic Louis Leroy which would have lasting effects on the history of art. Louis Leroy was, he was actually a painter and a printmaker and a playwright, so he was quite an interesting kind of polymath in himself. But he was best known now as the journalist who coined the term Impressionism. He was um, a very bad painter and as a, as a result was a rather bitter critic. I think the two things often go together. He was a critic for a newspaper called the Charivri, which was the precursor of Punch, in fact. If you look at old copies of Punch, you see that it's called um, Punch or the London Charivri. He was kind of utterly shocked by what he saw, went in there and said, that that particular painting, that was the one that he honed in on, was as rushed as it would be to create a wallpaper design. People uh, seem to think that it was a very negative review where he used this. It wasn't particularly negative. He was, Leroy was clearly searching for a word to describe that sense of fleetingness in the picture, and he came and said it was an impression, and somehow it just stuck. That word was then adopted by what we now know as the Impressionist group. I'm not performing miracles. I'm using up and wasting a lot of paint. The painting Impression Sunrise, along with the rest of the exhibition, had garnered much attention, yet it still remained unsold. Monet would eventually sell the work to Ernest Oshte for 800 francs. Two years later, when Oshte declared bankruptcy and was forced to sell his assets, the painting would only fetch 210 francs. The collector who purchased it was Georges de Bellio. It would then be inherited by his only daughter, Victorine, who bequeathed it to the Musée Marmottin in 1938. This is where the painting resides to this day. Although the term Impressionism had been used before, it was from this moment onwards that the Impressionist movement was born. Manet, Renoir, Pizarro, Cezanne were all contemporaries of Monet and would be the prominent figures in the Impressionist movement. The painters we now think of as the Impressionists were very close in the late 1860s, throughout the 70s, and into the 80s. They all seem to have painted each other and respected each other's work. You know, certainly Renoir, Manet and him were this sort of little unholy trinity. I think quite often seem to have slept with each other's wives, as far as I can gather. Into the 80s, they began to diverge. They began to take up different interests. They began not to spend as much time with one another, but to develop their careers independently. After the Impressionists came the Post-Impressionists, the Expressionists, the Cubists, the Surrealists. All these movements would come and go and push art forwards into the modern era. The work of Monet, however, would never disappear from the public consciousness. It would be the 1980s, however, which would see two events that would place Monet firmly in the center of the art world once again. In 1980, after much restoration, Monet's house and gardens in Giverny would be open to the public. But it was 1985 which would see Monet's masterpiece, Impression Sunrise, stolen from the Musée Marmottin in Paris. The theft in 1985 was actually, as art thefts go, pretty dramatic. It wasn't a stealthy thing where someone came in and quickly cut the canvas out. It was almost like a bank robbery. Five masked men on a quiet Sunday morning, apparently un under the instructions of a Japanese Yakuza gangster. He apparently said, you know, go, go and steal that picture. And, uh, and they, they sold seven, I think, altogether. People were told to get down on the floor and they took the work from there and ran off and disappeared. So it was a sort of dramatic crime. 
Five years later, after 1985, there was a tip-off to the police that it could be in Corsica. They were found there because of a tip-off that one of the police commissars uh, received when she was out in Japan, in Tokyo, I think, collecting some other stolen paintings. They did indeed find it in Corsica, where it had been kept for the five years, and it was returned. The theft and its subsequent return certainly raised awareness of this masterpiece. Monet, however, will always be more keenly associated with his later works from his garden in Giverny. But it was his unique view of his hometown of La Havre, Impression Sunrise, which would give its name to the Impressionist movement, the movement for which Claude Monet will forever be the pioneer. Somebody said, what should we call it for the catalogue? He was going to call it Marina. Presumably it would have been called Marinaism if, if it had stuck. And he just said, oh, I don't know, you can't call it view of the Havre because it's not a finished work, it's just an impression. So let's call it Impression Sunrise. And it stuck. Monet professed not to like having his work being reduced to the term Impressionism. On the other hand, he was perfectly aware it was he who had given the name to this movement that they all shared and that that would go down in history.